Hi, thanks for tuning in today to Front Porch Conversations here at Advent Christian Village. Today we're here at the Harmony Center, but it won't be long, I don't think, before we can be back on the porch. The weather is warming up and it's really nice. And we're having showers this morning, but they're leaf showers. The trees are getting rid of all their last year's leaves. I want to welcome our guest today, Dick Sodders. Thank you so much for being here, Dick. Thank you for having me. Dick, um, let us let our visitors uh, on watching on TV know where you were born and a little bit about your early years. Okay, I was born in Jamestown, Ohio, which is a little country town, and it's about 60 miles north of Cincinnati, Ohio. And uh, I was born in 1932, right during the Depression, and uh, my I was the fourth child and the youngest, of course, and when my mother was ready to have me, she started crying and she told my father, says, uh, I don't want the doctor who does the charity cases to deliver my baby because he's mean, says I've worked with him, he's mean to the mothers. So my dad went down the street about a block from the house and it was a Dr. Rittenauer that was there. And he asked Dr. Rittenauer if he would come and deliver me and he could pay him later on. And it was kind of a standing joke with my mother. I thought it was funny. She didn't get too much humor out of it. I says, you know, I don't know whether Dr. Rittenauer, our dad ever paid Dr. Rittenauer, and why he doesn't come back and repo me and I could be a doctor's son. <laughs> she didn't think it was funny. funny. But uh, then we moved to Xenia and uh, my dad worked on the WPA. And uh, so that's where I grew up was in Xenia. Do you have any memories of the Depression era? I remember standing in the commissary line with my mother getting food because, like I say, Dad worked on WPA, so we didn't have very much. And uh, I talked to other people since that time, and oh, well, they, the depression was over. And I said, no, it was just beginning. And I never wanted for anything because, you know, Dad, but Dad worked. Dad was a hard worker. He died at 67, and, uh, but uh, he was a very hard worker. And probably as a child, you didn't know what it would have been like before the Depression or after to know, you know, to have any comparisons. So. Not really. Uh, it was just normal. And uh, like I say, he, he was always there to provide. And that was the example he set for me. You provide for your family. Are, were you the youngest child? Yes. And do you have siblings still living? No. Uh, I had two sisters, one brother, and they were all dead. And... Uh, don't have any, hardly any relationship. Uh, I've got a goal in my life. My goal was to live to be 95. My great grandfather was the last Civil War veteran to die in Greene County, and he was 94. So I want to live to be 95 so I could be the oldest in the Sauter's family. My daughter says I should have a goal of living to be 105, but well, so we'll see. Well, get to 95 and then readjust if you want <laughs> right. to. Um, and what are some fond childhood memories? Uh, my first bicycle. Again, like I say, my father worked, so he bought two used bicycles off of my mother's brother. And he hand painted and striped them, uh, put the lights on them, fixed up the horn that goes into the frame of the old bicycles and so they would work and I remember those and he sent my brother and I out to the garage to get some paper or something and then he had them out on the front porch and he moved them into the living room around the tree and um, another thing I remember about my father my father only went to the fourth grade of school his uh, mother uh, or his father died and so he had to go to work mm -hmm. and the man could do anything. I got into photography when I was about 13. I loved taking pictures, which was... And you still do. <laughs> yes, I do. You see a lot of those. But... And he made me a dark room underneath the stairs going upstairs. And so I needed an enlarger so you could take negatives and enlarge them and have the paper in there. Well, he took a four-inch saucepan, took a hacksaw blade, sawed out the center of it, took a piece of stovepipe and put in there, and he worked at Wright Patterson Air Force Base at that time. And some way, somehow, he got a magnifying glass out of a bomb site. He fixed that into the stovepipe. And down below there, he made a plate where I could put the negative, and underneath, I could put my developing paper. And I could move that stovepipe up and down and enlarge the pictures. Wow. 
And so, like I say, it... That's ingenuity, isn't it? Oh, yes. But he, he bought the house, it cost him $850 when he bought our first house. And he changed it completely. It had no electricity in it, it had no water in it. The company came out and ran the main wires into the house, and then he did all the wiring inside. Same way with the plumbing, we didn't have anything inside. They ran the plumbing and he did all the plumbing inside. We had the outside toilet for quite a few years before we had a bathroom in the house. Um, did you go all the way through school in Xenia? Yes, I graduated in 1951 Xenia. Well, I'm going to come back and ask you more about that later. Okay. Um, and then what did you do following high school? Uh, before I even graduated, I got a job working at uh, NCR. And I worked at NCR for 22 years. I was uh, at the end of it for the last oh, five to seven years. I was a first line supervisor in assembly. And uh, so then I went to McCulley Corporation, which made airplane propellers for Cessna aircraft. And from there, I went to Dayton Walther, where they make the big truck wheels. That's Salt Walther, who is a driver at the Indianapolis 500. That was his father owned that business. And so then I, they also made brakes for recreational vehicles there. And so when that went down on the energy crunch back in, I had to leave there and I went to O.S. Kelly where they made piano plates and between O.S. Kelly and Wickham's in Springfield, Ohio, they made 99% of the piano plates, the big cast iron plates in the world. Wow. And so uh, from there, I went to, uh, I guess when I went to the church as the custodian at the church, plus I got a job at J.C. Penney's. I worked 13 and a half years at J.C. Penney's, retired there in 2001. But before then, I went up to uh, Hobart Corporation, worked at Hobart Corporation for 10 years. And uh, so I've had several jobs. I wasn't adding all the way through that, but you were employed for about how many years? I worked till I was 75. My last job was uh, I worked at a funeral home and I ran the crematory for seven years. Wow, that's yeah. quite an employment history. <laughs> and I'm, I'm impressed that you can keep them all in order. And oh, yes. <laughs> But there was a variety of... Oh, yes. Very interesting jobs. Met a lot of different people. And um, you, I understand you were married. When were you married and where did you meet your wife? Uh, I m met my wife in Fairborn. She was a classmate of Marcia's. And uh, uh, people who know Marcia Pottle, she was uh, Marcia Knoll back in, when I first met her. And when I first met her, I, a friend of mine asked me, says, will you take me to Fairborn to get my class ring back? This was in May of 1950. So I said, sure. So I took him over to Fairborn and I, it was a dead end street. She lived at 40 West Emerson. And I drove down the street the dead end, turned around, came parked in front of her house. And he went in and he went in there very long. He walked out came back to the car, and as he came back to the car, she walked out on the front porch. And I looked at her, and, I, and he got in the car. I said, I'm gonna date that girl. He says, I don't care. And this was the girl he was breaking up with? Yeah, that was Marsha Pottle. Oh, that was Marsha, okay. Yeah, that was Marsha Pottle. And Marsha and my wife were classmates. And I had to go into this to get back to the Mary. To the original question. Right, so, but anyway, um, Marsha and Jean were real close friends and classmates and a girl living next door, Margie Reynolds, were real close. And so um, uh, my brother married Jean's sister, Mary Kindred, and I was the best man and she was maid of honor. And so uh, after the wedding there at the house, I walked out on the front porch and walked out in the front yard and Marcia and Margie were out there. and. Marcia got up in my face and she was really mad that I had brought this George Gannon over to get his class ring back and she So time went on I asked Jean To set me up a date with Marcia Jean and I'd had a couple of dates and she says okay So she set me up in 1950. I went to their senior class play and Jean even told her that when I held hands I like to interlock the fingers and so uh, from that, then Marsha and I dated for about three and a half years. But uh, then 
Later on, I married Jean, and we got married in 57, and we had two children, and five grandchildren, and 11 great-grandchildren. Wow. And so. And um, Jean passed away. She died in May 30th, 1957, 1957, 2015. Okay. Let's start back to, um, how long were you and, and Jean married? 58 years. And she died recently or in the she, di she died, like I say, no, she died uh, in 2015. And, uh, and did you live in the same town all during your marriage? We bought a, we got married in 1957, bought a house in 1958 and lived in that same house. We had one built, but we only lived in it about four months and had some water problems, so we moved back. And I still own the house up there. And tell us about your children. Uh, my daughter, Denise, is just turned 60 the 11th of January. And uh, my son is, uh, will turn 58 in August. And uh, I had a standing joke also with my daughter. I was an avid bowler. I bowled four nights a week. And uh, so she was born on my bowling night. So whenever her birthday comes around, I always remind her when I send her a birthday card with something to do with bowling, that she had to be born on my bowling night. But I take it you did go to the hospital instead of bowling? Yes, I did. Okay, I did good. go there. Yes, I did. Because that might be another long story. No, <laughs> no. Yes, it would be. No, but uh, yes. So. Um, when you, uh, and do they live nearby? My daughter lives in Crestview. She married a boy from Fairborn, and they've got uh, two children. They had two children, and uh, so... Uh, I go over to see her, and that's part of the story with Marcia, too, so, uh, when we get to that. Um, earlier, you talked about your early interest in photography. Yes. Tell us about what's transpired with your photography between early years and now. Well, I even took some of the pictures for my, our senior class annual, and then uh, I I don't know how many different cameras that I've got. I served 19 months in the service, took a lot of pictures down in Louisiana where I was stationed. And uh, it was just something that I got involved in and loved doing. And I've had some here in the village. I've had pictures put down there that... In the art, the photography gallery. Right. And yes. it's just, uh, I don't know, I, I just always enjoyed them. It, I, as a matter of fact, I developed Marsha's class pictures because I worked with the photographer who took the pictures for our senior class pictures. And I went to his house, he had a whole dark room down. And so I helped develop the pictures for the senior class. Now, have you moved to primarily doing cam uh, using your phone for picture taking? No, no, you, no, no, I've got a... You're more of a purist than that. Yeah, I've got a 35 millimeter that I bought off of my grandson's wife, plus I bought a lens off of, um, <laughs> name slipped my mind, here in the village, the one okay. that, that takes all the pictures, not, and, uh, but anyway, I bought, bought the lens, and it's a 300 millimeter, the other one was a 200 millimeter, and so I take pictures through the doors, I go outside, take pictures, uh, the vultures, I think, know who I am when I come out with my camera. <laughs> And do they smile or just? Yeah, some of them do, and some of them aren't too happy. But uh, I, I just love any. I, I have an act of seeing things that aren't supposed to be there. It's a, a different thing from the. Like I looked out the door one day, and out on the um, that old, or out on the um, magnolia tree, up in the top, I looked up there. And the leaves, as you were talking about them, look like an Indian maiden because there was a group, one branch that stuck up had little leaves up on it like that that looked like her head, uh, the feathers on her head. And so I just, something that's not supposed to be there is what I see. And if it moves, I get my camera and I take a picture of it. When you were talking about um, you worked as the church custodian and you yes. worked for a funeral home, 
tell us a little bit about your faith journey. As I mentioned a while ago that uh, I bowled, bowling was my God. Like I say, I bowled four nights a week and I drank two cases of beer a week plus all the drinks that I had at the bowling alley because the fellows I bowl with, I was a good bowler. It was the sport that I really excelled in. And I had a lifetime average of 190. If you know anything about bowling, it's a pretty good average. But I went all over. I bowled in Chicago. I bowled in Detroit. I bowled in Indianapolis. I bowled in West Virginia. Wherever there was a tournament, I bowled. And at class, my wife would have family reunions. And I would go, but if I had a bowling tournament, I'd go to that bowling tournament. And so, uh, and I did a lot of other things. I was smoking 12 cigars a day. And so when I was working here at the bowling alley this one night, I just for some reason or other, it just flooded in on me. And I came home from work and I told my wife, I said, I've got to talk to somebody. And she says, uh, well, why don't you call the prayer tower out Oral Roberts University in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So she gave me a book that had a phone number on it. It says, you're going to call up here or go down in the basement. We had a rec room. Uh, I'm going to the basement. So I went down there and I looked at the number. And I thought, well, I'm going to have to, that's long distance. So I went back upstairs and I said, that's long distance. And she says, yes, you'll have to dial one. So I went back downstairs and kind of laughed to myself. Boy, that's something. She's wanting me to call Tulsa, Oklahoma. And we have arguments when I call my mother in Xenia, 11 miles away. But I called and a lady answered the phone and says, prayer tower, may I help you? And I said, yes, I says, my world is caving in and I have such pressure on me, I, I just don't know what to do. And she says, can I pray for you? I says, yes, I don't care. Whatever you want to do, just go ahead. So she started praying and then she said, will you pray with me? And so I prayed the sinner's prayer and I knew that that's what it was because at age 10, my brother and I and another kid had went to the United Brethren Church and a pastor had taken us up there and we prayed then. Mm -hmm. So as I started praying, I started crying. The more I prayed, the more I cried. I came upstairs and I told him, I have a weight that's been lifted off of me that I cannot explain. There's just no way to describe it. Uh, I quit drinking right then. I've never had a drink since then. The day later, I was smoking a cigar, and I looked at it, and I thought, what am I doing with this? And I threw it down there, and then I had to go sweep it up. I never smoked again after that. And um, I didn't realize what a grip that the alcohol had on me, because whenever my wife would say something about me drinking too much, I would always go back to a fellow that I worked with at NCR, who would take one drink, and he was drunk. So, and then, one time I went to a prayer, men's prayer meeting in the morning and a friend had brought a young man there, he's 32 years old and he was admitted alcoholic. And then he says, but I'm not down in the gutter with the winos. Everybody who's an alcoholic has somebody they look down on and justify their own. So, uh, then like I say, I have never looked back after that, it's just been and uh, another thing that I am so, I have to say, proud of, when I got saved, I went over, this was in 1976. My dad died in 67. My mother was living in an apartment above my brother's. And so uh, I went into her apartment. She stuck her finger in my face, says, don't you come in here talking to me about church. And I says, mother, when you want to hear about it, I'll tell you. So later on, she fell and broke her shoulder. So she came and lived with us for a period of time. And my wife took care of her and all that. And then later on, when she was 80 years old, she fell and broke her hip and had to go into a nursing home. So we went to visit her every Sunday. And this one Sunday I went over, I always wore these televangelist pin, lapel mm -hmm. pins. And I had one on that was a trumpet and it said, perhaps today, and uh, she wanted it. So I took it off and started to put it on her gown. I knew they'd throw it away. And I had bought her a little stuffed rabbit. So I pinned it on that stuffed rabbit. And my wife says, tell her what that means. 
And I says, perhaps the day the trumpet will sound, the Lord will come back and take his with him up to heaven. I said, Mother, would you like to accept Jesus? And I prayed with my mother at age 80, and she accepted Christ. Three months after that, she had a stroke and couldn't speak. Mm -hmm. And so I know that someday I'll see her in heaven. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Earlier, you mentioned Marsha a couple of times. So yes. let's tell our viewers, Marsha, it's Marsha Pottle that um, Dick is talking about, and she's lived here, or lived here in the village for many years. So how did your pathways cross again? Uh, I came home, I'd been somewhere, and I came home, and on my caller ID, there was a name, Arthur Pottle, M.A. And I thought, Arthur Pottle? I don't know an Arthur Pottle. But I had met him seven years prior to that at a class reunion that he attended. And so uh, I thought, M.A., could that be Marcia? And my wife had an address book, and Marcia was married four times, and she had all the different addresses where she lived and names. And the only one that I could remember was Stump. She was married to Robert Stump. And the reason I could remember it, he was into flea markets and antiques. He was an old-time hoarder. And so they called it Stump's Dump. So I got the book out, and I looked through it, and I couldn't find it. So I had called. Uh, well, let me back up. Marcia called her classmate, Margie Reynolds, out in uh, Colorado and told her about Art dying. And she told her about Jean dying. And that's the reason she had called me. So I then called the same group, Margie, out in Colorado. And she says, yes, that's Marcia. So I went ahead and called her and my daughter lived in Crestview so it was only 200 miles apart so we talked and I was going down to my daughter's house and so Marcia drove over and we met halfway at a rest area and I just went to my daughter's during Super Bowl and it's mile marker 160 because I wanted to look at it again and remember so uh, anyway we met her there and I walked up into the park and looking for her. and here said a uh, black gentleman sitting on a wall he was one of the custodians there at the uh, rest area and then there was a telephone pay telephone on the wall and a woman standing here and so I walked up there and I said Marcia and she turned around and then later on she asked me says how did you ever pick me out I says a black gentleman sitting on a wall, a telephone on the wall, and one woman. I said it wasn't too hard to pick <laughs> you out. So uh, she brought me down here, and I spent a week in the lodge, and we talked because she knew my family, and I knew her family, and they were all dead, and so we compared notes. And I went back to my daughter's house, and we went to a movie, and they had the movie The Miracle, and in that miracle where a girl fell down the tree, and something, I don't remember much about it. But after we, we walked out of the theater, and walking along there, and I says, Denise, I have found my miracle. I says, you know, Marcia was my first love. I says, I have to go back. So um, she came again, I came over and spent two weeks at the lodge, and we talked some more. And then, uh, so we got back together, and when uh, we couldn't get married because her last husband, Art, was a retired colonel, so Paul Bertolino, who's a retired minister, came to the house. We had, we talked about a commitment service. Marcia had said something about it. She'd heard about it. And Paul came over on his own one day, and he says, I'll do a commitment service for you if you want me to. So we had the full ceremony, and we committed to God and ourselves. And uh, so then that's my first time here, and we just had just a wonderful time. And... Uh, meeting all the different people here and I just feel so welcome here at the village and and um how long were you married you and Marcia almost five years and uh so on January the 14th uh 2016 is when we first met um, you and Marcia had some good years together, and I know it was an important part of her life. Right. Uh, she First thing, I'd never been on a cruise, so the very first thing she did was took me on a cruise to Alaska. 
And then we went to, on the cruise with uh, Tim Zimmerman's brass to the, the Caribbean. And we made many, many bus trips with uh, Madison Travel and saw a lot of different things and just enjoyed life totally. Uh, Marcia never had a pet. And so when she got me, she also got my miniature schnauzer. And when uh, my schnauzer was not a really a friendly or friendly, but she was friendly, she wasn't a compassionate dog or anything mm -hmm. like that. She didn't like to be held. But when my wife died, I went over and was sitting in her chair one day and the dog came over and jumped up in my lap. And from that time on, she was always there. And so uh, she was with Marcia all the time we went. I had to have her put down when she was just about 13. I, she'd had a stroke and I had to have her put to sleep. And so that was about three months before Marcia passed away. So, well, um, I so appreciate you coming and sitting down with me today and visiting. And um, I appreciate so much your stories you've told. And for members of the village who've known Marsha for years, it's a nice connection for them as well. Yeah, it's been, uh, people have asked me if I'm going to stay here or what I'm going to do. And I said, well, I don't have any friends back in Ohio. I got a neighbor lives next door, a neighbor lives across the street. And that's the only people I know. I've got a few nieces that live up close. But uh, as far as friends, my friends are here in Advent Christian Village. And I have many. And that's a great place to have friends. Right. And I thank Marcia for that because she's the one that introduced me. And like I say, I just feel so privileged to be welcomed into this village. Thank you so much, Dick. It's my pleasure. And thank you for tuning in. And I hope to have another Front Porch conversation for you to join us on soon.